Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Peter Giuliano. I am the uh, Chief Research Officer and um, uh, for the Specialty Coffee Association and the Executive Director of the Coffee Science Foundation. And it's my pleasure to host this session of the Expo Lectures series entitled The Impact of Brew Temperature and Extraction on the Sensory Quality of Coffee. So before I introduce the speaker, I wanted to um, uh, thank the sponsors that make this, this series uh, possible. The title sponsor is um, P Pacific Barista Series, um, who've helped support this whole thing. Also uh, underwriting are Saver Brands, Chemex, and Rose Star. So we express our sincere gratitude to them for making this lecture series possible. All right, so on to the lecture itself. Um, I wanted to just give a little background. This is one of the lectures of a few that we've had um, this weekend that are the out, outputs of a research project um, that we started with UC Davis um, about three years ago. And, uh, and we collaborated on, a, on an idea for exploring um, the, uh, the impacts of various um, parameters on, uh, on making on the flavor and chemistry of brewed coffee. And so um, we're so excited um, for all of these outputs. Um, this was all made possible by a grant from Breville, which uh, uh, you'll hear a little bit more about um, later, um, but I wanna express my gratitude to them too. So without um, any further ado, I would like to introduce Mackenzie Batali. She's a PhD student at the University of California, Davis, and she's going to be delivering today's lecture. Thanks for being here, Mackenzie. Thanks, Peter. Take it away. All right, um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm Kenzie, I'm a PhD student at UC Davis, um, and I'm here to talk about the impact of brew temperature and extraction on the sensory quality of coffee. A little bit about my background. Um, so I've, I'm not coming from the coffee industry. I am a scientist who is using my skills in conjunction with coffee. So I have a background in chemistry. I started in organic chemistry and worked in an artificial flavor and fragrance synthesis lab. Um, and that's what introduced me to sensory science. So that's what led me to my graduate degree in food science at UC Davis, uh, where I've gotten to start working with the coffee center. To give a, a quick outline of this talk, I'm gonna give a little bit of background on the UC Davis Coffee Center, um, and then give some history and motivation for the extraction research and then talk more specifically about the samples I was researching. Um, then the methodology we use for sensory analysis, which might be a little bit different than what people are familiar with in the coffee industry. We're not using cupping scores. Um, we're looking at sensory trends across the coffee brewing control chart and then future directions for sensory research. So the UC Davis Coffee Center started uh, in 2013 um, when the Design of Coffee course opened up, which is a um, gen ed chemical engineering course that teaches uh, undergraduates engineering principles using coffee as a medium. And this caught the attention of the coffee industry, which started the UC Davis Coffee Center. And a lot of research has been built out of that foundation. And there's an overarching goal to do for coffee, what UC Davis has already done for wine and beer. This is the building that I work in. Um, we have this world-class food science facility, a pilot brewery, pilot winery. We have degree tracks for all of those things. And we're trying to do that with the UC Davis Coffee Center. So that's a bit about where I'm from. And currently the coffee brewing research I'm working at I'm a part of at UC Davis, is at the intersection of engineering and food science. So we're looking how the physical processes of extraction, we have experiments related to basket shape, pulsing cycle, uh, fractionation, all of that on the impact on simple parameters, like uh, absorption, percent extraction, pH, total dissolved solids. And then we're looking at how those engineering parameters relate to the final consumable product using descriptive sensory analysis, consumer preference testing, which some of you may have heard about yesterday in uh, my colleague Andrew Cotter's talk and chemical analysis. 
So some background on what we're looking at with the coffee brewing control chart. Uh, so to give some history, um, in the 1950s, Dr. Ernest Earl Lockhart at MIT at the Coffee Brewing Institute looked at how um, total dissolved solids and percent extraction relates to the sensory quality of coffee and consumer liking of coffee and developed the coffee brewing control chart here. Um, so we have the coffee brewing control chart, which is the mass relationship between total dissolved solids, the strength, the yield, the percent extraction, and the brew formula. Um, but there's some sensory problems with the chart. Um, from a sensory science perspective, we've got um, verbiage, we've got developed and underdeveloped, um, which isn't necessarily a super descriptive term. We've got strong and weak, but we're not really sure what is strong, which flavors are strong, which flavors are weak. And then we have bitter on the right side of the chart and conflating with ideal, which from a sensory science perspective, um, ideal and uh, is a preference term and bitter is a descriptive term. And these things really shouldn't be conflated um, in a sensory space. Uh, but there's a lot more to coffee than what's in than the limited verbiage on this chart. Um, also out of UC Davis, um, we've, we developed a coffee taster flavor wheel, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And um, in the years since the coffee brewing control chart was developed, there's so much more understanding of the chemical drivers of coffee flavor. And there is more understanding of how different uh, parameters will, will extract certain flavors. Um, and we're, our overall goal is to figure out how in more detail these many different flavors in coffee change across this coffee brewing control chart. Mm. So yeah, our main research objective for, for, the, for this project was how do specific sensory attributes change in respect to the coffee brewing control chart? And uh, basic hypothesis is if coffee is brewed at different positions on the chart, then perceived sensory will change. So in order to brew all across the coffee brewing control chart, um, we look at what different factors impact extraction. So you can change extraction through a handful of different things, different brew ratios, as you can see with the lines on the chart, uh, will impact extraction. Grind size, obviously a smaller grind size, more contact, uh, more surface contact with the water, um, that'll increase extraction, move up the chart. A longer brewing time uh, and duty cycle, which I'll get into in a bit, um, changing the flow rate of water, uh, water mineral content, um, which we're not really getting into in this talk, but, but, but different uh, mineral compositions of water will impact extraction, and water temperature. Hotter water will extract more. Uh, and one of the other questions we wanted to ask was, do any of these factors make a difference when extraction is controlled? And what we wanted to look at was water temperature. So basically asking the question is if, if we brew at different water temperatures, adjusting all these other uh, variables like brew ratio, grind size, brewing time uh, to keep extraction consistent, um, will the flavor profile be different? So that's our second question. Um, so essentially trying to brew uh, coffee at 20% extraction and 1.5 total dissolved solid, will that taste different if you get that from uh, 87 degrees Celsius water temperature or a 93 degrees Celsius water temperature? Um, why do we care? Why do we think this will make a difference? Um, so as an extreme example, um, cold brew versus iced coffee, hot brewed than iced coffee, will have a different flavor profile. 
we've had we've experienced that uh, in our um, in coffee shops, I'm sure. Um, and there are different flavor compounds that will uh, extract more readily at higher temperatures versus lower temperatures. Uh, and uh, higher brew temperatures do require more energy. So it might be of interest to know if we can make quality coffee in a more energy efficient way. Um, and because of some of these uh, these things, um, we did hypothesize that the that um, the temperature would have an effect on sensory profile, even if extraction was controlled. So, to recap, two goals, three variables. We're looking at the impact of extraction, which has two variables: total dissolved solids and percent extraction, and the impact of brew temperature. So. That gave us 27 samples to evaluate. We had three water temperatures, which was 87 degrees, 90, and 93. Uh, this was the range we were able to evaluate with our with the brewers we had. Um, we had percent extraction at 16, 20, and 24 percent, and TDS of one, 1.25, and 1.5. 1 27 samples total, all brewed with the same coffee on the same brewers. Um, and one of the ways we systematically brew all of these different samples to the correct percent extraction and TDS um, is uh, through manipulating the duty cycle. So we were using a uh, highly programmable Curtis uh, G4 brewers, and we can manipulate the flow rate of water through the water pulsing duty cycle. So the duty cycle refers to the percent of time water is dispensing versus turned off. So the example here, there would be a 40 second pulse on, water dispenses for 40 seconds, and then it turns off um, for another 40 seconds. That's a 50% duty cycle. Uh, that would take a longer time to dispense the same amount of water as than if water was just dispensing 100% of the time, just no time off. Um, so that's what we mean when we talk about duty cycle. Um, so we have a lot of different options um, for how we can speed up and um, lower extraction or slow down and increase extraction by lowering the flow rate of water through these duty cycles. And this will, uh, from preliminary data, we saw that we were able to cover most of the coffee to brewing control chart just by changing the brew ratio and the duty cycle. So if you decrease the duty cycle, you increase extraction and strength. And I want to drive home the point that we adjusted these parameters so that we were achieving the same level of extraction at different brewing temperature because hotter water will increase TDS and PE. Um, so um, we have our brew at 87 degrees Celsius, grind size three. Um, and this was, I believe, a 67% duty cycle. Um, and then at 93, uh, went to a coarser grind size, um, which of course are grind size, but that lowered the extraction too much. So then we adjust it by slightly adjusting the duty cycle to a 50% duty cycle. Um, so this is how we brew same extraction profile at different water temperatures. So that was controlled. So we have all these brews. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about how in my discipline, we quantify flavor. So sensory science, is the use of human subjects to evaluate products. And um, there's two main fields of sensory science. Um, there's descriptive analysis, which, in my, which is what I did, which is a panel of eight to 15 trained tasters, and it is quantitative. They're selecting attributes and just evaluating their presence and their change in intensity. Um, they are not talking about liking and then uh, 
what uh, Andrew Cotter presented yesterday was consumer science, where untrained coffee drinkers rank products based on liking and how attributes contribute to liking. Um, so this tells you what people think is good in coffee. And so I focus on descriptive analysis. I'm not looking at what's ideal. I'm just looking at what's there and then giving that data back to the coffee industry and you get to decide um, based on that what your ideal is. Uh, so these panels, I had 12 people for this panel and they're, um, they go through a training together as a group. They taste coffees, work with the coffee taster flavor wheel, um, and uh, work with the coffee taster flavor wheel. And um, they just come up with term generation. They come up with terms um, that they think apply to the coffee. Um, and from there, I build references. So. Some of this is based on, some of you might be familiar with the World Coffee Research Sensory Lexicon. I work with that a little bit, um, depending on what I find works for my panel and for my set of attributes. Um, they'll have real world references that they'll then get to uh, smell and sometimes taste alongside drinking coffee to help them uh, refine their sensory language. Um, so that every panelist is on the same page when they say something is floral, they know what that is, or nutty. We all know that that refers to the case of floral, chamomile tea, in the case of nutty, like roasted hazelnuts or something. Um, and so this is standardized across the panel. And we get further panelist calibration, which is uh, so they taste references mixed into coffee um, to get measures of intensity. Uh, this is always a fun one for training. Um, and uh, we make sure everyone is aligned on scale um, and uh, attribute recognition when the attribute is masked a little bit by the coffee matrix. And then finally data collection. They're no longer working in a group um, so we have these red lit sensory booths. Uh, will they be served through a door? They'll get one sample at a time uh, with a three digit blinding code and they'll rate all attributes on an unlabeled line scale uh, with low uh, and high anchors. Um, and this will give me a score out of 100 but they're not focusing on numbers, they're just focusing on relative intensity. Um, and they'll rate all attributes for all samples, and they'll come back for multiple sessions and evaluate samples in triplicate so that we can evaluate panelists' consistency and really have a rigorous, reliable data. Um, and then, so these scores out of 100 uh, give us a lot of data. Um, this is actually a slide from a previous project, but uh, we, yeah, we get these scores out of 100. And then, um, so this is an example of some of the descriptive analysis data. We can see intensities of citrus at all of these different samples. This isn't really a good way to visualize this because we had 30 attributes and 27 samples. Um, and trying to parse out these bar plots for all of these attributes. Um, not, not very easy to uh, start to make conclusions about the data. So I want to uh, go over multivariate data visualization. So to visualize our results, we use what's called principal component analysis, which creates a two-dimensional product space that encompasses the variation between samples. And so we map out our product space and say we have sample one on here and that doesn't really tell us anything. And then we can put sample two on the other side of the product space. And because they're far away from each other, these products are different. Um, then we put sample three in here and sample one and sample three are quite similar because of their proximity 
in the product space, and then they're different from sample two. Um, and sample four, um, it's kind of not that similar to any of the samples that are up here already, but then that's where I bring in the dimensions. So um, you can actually go more than two dimensions in this, but I'm keeping it simple. Uh, these percentages uh, tell you how much of the variation is encompassed by that direction. Um, so because it's 57%, this is an arbitrary number, this, are my, this is my data, um, on the horizontal direction, that means samples one and sample two are more different. There's more space in between them than the vertical direction, sample two and sample four, for example, um, because that's only 22% of the difference. But we have these percentages here because sometimes the first dimension will be, you know, an even larger percentage and we don't want to put it to scale because that would make a very difficult graph to read. Um, so we see these samples, their similarities, their differences. This still doesn't mean that much. So then we can add these vectors that correspond to the sensory attributes. And these vectors point in the direction of the samples that are associated with them. So we've got fruity associated with sample one and sample three, chocolate associated with sample four, and burnt associated with sample two. And so now you're not getting exact values of means and differences out of this, but this is a way you can place all your results in one space and explore how they're similar and different. So this is pretty simplified, um, but I wanna move in to my actual results um, really quickly. Um, we've got sample nomenclature that uh, I'm gonna use pretty consistently while I'm showing you these results. Um, so we've got 90, the brew temperature first, dash 1.25, total dissolved solids, dash 20, percent extraction. So it's always presented in that order, temperature, TDS, PE. Um, and this is how all the samples will be labeled in the principal component analysis. Um, so this is the actual results. And I've got them, I'm gonna show you three plots of the same data, just color coded differently by a variable. So in this one, we have the 1% TDS samples in green, the 1.25 in yellow, and the 1.5 in brown. And you see a really clear separation. We see uh, on the left side of the space, we see the low uh, TDS samples associated with black tea, a little bit like fruity and nutty, um, but that's, that's pointing up, so uh, not quite as much. And then in the middle, the medium TDS, and then the high TDS associated with a lot of these other attributes, bitter, rubber, ashy, brown roast, astringent. So really clear separation there. Um, then we can look at percent extraction. So we've got the 16% extraction uh, in blue, the 20% extraction in purple, and 24% extraction in red. Um, so we see the low percent extraction uh, in the upper right-hand corner associated with berry, citrus, sour, fermented. Uh, and then moving down to the lower left-hand corner, we've got the higher percent extraction associated really just with black tea um, at the low TDS. And then um, some of the higher percent extraction, high TDS associated with ashy brown roast. Um, and some of those other attributes. So it's not quite as clear of a separation with uh, by percent extraction as it is by TDS, but um, it's there's still clear there's still somewhat clear regions that associate with um, those different levels. And then we look at brew temperature, and from this, there's no obvious trends. So in teal, we've got the uh, 87 degrees brew temperature in pink we've got 90 and in brown we've got 93 um and yeah there's from this 
there's no clear visual trends. Um, and then we can simplify this a little bit because this is a lot of samples. And we, we can look at the overall means for, um, we can look at the overall means for each of the variables with these uh, spider plots. So we've got um, the three levels of TDS and uh, so, um, and how they increase in intensity and all the attributes with asterisks were significantly different um, for uh, significantly different by TDS. So a lot of attributes vary with TDS, bitter, sour, astringent, citrus, fermented, all of these, um, which isn't terribly surprising. You make a stronger coffee, a lot of the attributes are going to get stronger. Um, and we see some attributes varying by percent extraction, but a lot fewer. Um, it, overall means for each level of percent extraction, we see significant differences, sour, astringent, black tea, berry, citrus, fermented, um, but not as many as TDS. And then we only saw one attribute, nutty, that had a slightly different um, uh, different, a slight difference in means by brewing temperature, but overall different brewing temperatures at fixed extraction don't impact coffee as significantly as we expected. Um, so that was an interesting result um, that we did not expect. Um, and fr from all of these side by side, we can conclude that TDS is the biggest driver of difference in coffee followed by percent extraction and brewing temperature. It really doesn't matter that much um, if you control extraction in other ways. Um, basically what I just said. <laughs> um, yeah, so within the range measured, um, brew temperature has limited impact on the sensory quality of coffee. Um, yeah. So we have all these results. We had our, um, uh, our PCAs. Um, of, and intensities for all these different attributes. And our second goal was to understand how this related to the coffee brewing control chart. Um, so we're trying to figure out how to put this back onto the chart. So we use a three dimensional mapping method. So you probably uh, saw this, um, this might be a review if you saw Bill or Andrew's talks over the last few days, but basically you think of it like um, elevation maps. So we've got different uh, colors coded to different elevations. Um, so you're representing a three-dimensional space in a two-dimensional map. And there is a graphing method that is commonly used in sensory science that is, um, uh, that is similar to this. And it's called response surface method methodology. So we're representing three dimensions in a two-dimensional graph with color coding. And it's basically representing what's shown here is we've got a percent extraction on the x-axis, total dissolved solids on the y-axis, and then a color coded z-axis um, showing the three-dimensional intensity of um, how attributes vary with TDS and percent extraction um, using a, yeah, either through a linear uh, first order fit or a quadratic second order fit. So we've got our brewing control chart space. And one of the first examples I want to show you is just how bitter taste changes within this space. So these are the attributes intensities. Um, and we see it varying um, mostly with TDS. Uh, so this is a first order fit. It's just a, you know, a sloped plane. Um, and yeah, so we see bitterness varying mostly with TDS. There was not a significant correlation with percent extraction. Um, but, uh, yeah, so that's the first thing that we can start to note. Uh, maybe doesn't quite line up with the coffee brewing control chart. Uh, TDS plays a bigger role um, in bitterness than 
uh, percent extraction, um, um, where the chart indicates that percent extraction is important for bitterness. Um, so we have some of these attributes that are scaling just with TDS. We had bitter taste, astringent mouthfeel, viscous mouthfeel, and rubber flavor. Um, you might notice that these don't change very much. Um, that's pretty normal in descriptive sensory analysis um, because panelists use the scale somewhat differently. The overall difference in means for all panelists over all sessions is going to be numerically pretty small um, to represent a, pretty, a meaningful difference. So. Um, if you're looking at this and seeing like, oh, that only varies by six points out of 100, um, that's that's pretty normal um, for sensory results. So that's not something to discount. So then we have attributes, a lot of attributes that increase with TDS, but decrease with percent extraction. Sour was one of the most substantial. Sourness was actually the attribute that did change the most substantially um, across the range of variables, um, a 20 point difference out of 100 in terms of sensory results um, is huge. Uh, <laughs> so sourness and some associated flavors like citrus and fermented, um, uh, at least with this coffee, evaluated uh, is one of the attributes that's really most affected by extraction alone. And then we have only a few attributes that increase with both total dissolved solids and percent extraction. So we have ashy and brown roast flavor, and these have a second order fit. So it's curved um, and it means that uh, percent extraction plays a role in these flavors. Uh, only to a certain point where it curves the, it's not really increasing with increasing percent extraction anymore. Um, but ultimately these are both increasing towards the upper corner of the coffee brewing control chart. Um, and then only one attribute correlates with low TDS and high PE. So this was one different extraction pattern from all other attributes. So we had our black tea flavor, um, which actually had a peak at the high percent extraction, low TDS range. Um, so that, uh, yeah, so that decreases as coffee strength increases, um, but increases with time, with percent extraction and brewing time. Um, so that's another interesting result um, that there is one attribute that is peaking in a part of the brewing control chart that is indicated to be weak. Um, and we see some trends that do hold true for different types of coffee. So this isn't the only study that has done response surface mapping of coffee uh, descriptive analysis data. So uh, Dr. Scott Frost, uh, evaluated three different roast levels and found some attribute intensity, uh, some attribute trends that uh, that were true regardless of roast level. And we see some similar results to what I presented. We see in his data, bitterness had a little bit of a dependence on PE, but it still was driven significantly by TDS. Astringency um, is mostly related to TDS. Sourness and citrus have this, and, and fermented have this consistent trend of um, of uh, peaking at the high TDS, low percent extraction. Um, and so, this is a really interesting way to start looking at how a new brewing control chart uh, could be developed once we start to confirm these trends across different types of coffee. Obviously no two coffees are gonna extract exactly the same way because every type of coffee, every roast, every every green coffee is a unique, uh, has unique proportions of all the flavors that we love.
but we're starting to see some trends. He even found uh, an increase in sweetness at low TDS, which is uh, consistent with some other projects we've seen where we've seen lower TDS samples, um, lower TDS samples perceived as more sweet. Um, yeah. And the next question, um, this is gonna be a recap of a little bit of what Andrew talked about yesterday, but in case you missed it, um, is the question of what is actually ideal. Um, so the middle of the coffee brewing control chart says that 1.25, 1.3 TDS, 20% extraction is the ideal coffee. And that has informed the gold cup standard. Um, but we're trying to figure out if that actually holds true for what consumers like. So Andrew used the same samples, um, same brewing parameters that I evaluated and found and uh, asked untrained consumers to rank liking. Um, so among other things, they evaluated on a nine point scale of dislike extremely to like extremely. Um, and consistent with my results, they found that we found that brew temperature also played very little role in liking since it doesn't seem to change uh, sensory attributes very much. It also doesn't change liking very much. The only uh, the only preference was related to coffee being too hot. Um, and then consumers can separate into different clusters of liking. So Andrew found uh, two distinct trends for consumer liking. So I can plot this back into the PCA space um, with my descriptive analysis data. And so in red, we have represented two different clusters of consumers. So one group of consumers tends to like the higher TDS coffee and maybe likes the, like some of the flavors, the bitterness, uh, spice, roasty flavors a little more. It's pointing in that dire the direction of those samples. And the other cluster you can, is associated with the lower TDS samples tends to like um, weaker, a, li a little bit weaker, more tea, floral, maybe maybe a little bit sweeter samples. Um, so ultimately, there's no one size fits all ideal. So, what we're proposing, based on our data, our, our data, is a new design for the coffee brewing control chart to illustrate these sensory trends. So, maybe doing away with the ideal box at all and looking at how we can illustrate the regions of the coffee brewing control chart that will, that will associate with specific flavors so that then when you're brewing your coffee, you can brew to extract whatever kind of flavors you like. You can brew to different extraction to shine, to, to make different flavors of different types of coffee shine. If you're trying to increase brightness, you know, you might want to be up uh, in the upper left hand corner. And if you're um, trying to increase sweetness, move down, all of those things uh, so that you have a guide to brew your own ideal instead of an ideal that's one size fits all that really uh, shouldn't be uh, held that way. Uh, so, Summarize what we found. Uh, temperature within the range we studied does not substantially impact coffee sensory quality. It doesn't mean temperature doesn't matter. It just means that within the range of hot drip brew coffee, extraction is going to make a difference. It doesn't matter what temperature you use to get there. But there's some, there's a small amount of data out there looking at ranges uh, from 22 degrees Celsius up to 100 at fixed extraction um, that indicates that wider ranges do matter. And the next project we're looking at is cold brew versus hot brew at fixed extraction, fixed consumption temperature to see um, what role the larger range in temperature makes a difference. And 
Lastly, we know that extraction plays a substantial role. We've been doing a tremendous amount of extraction research over the last few years, and we're trying to find ways to update and expand the coffee brewing control chart with the data we have, with what I showed you previously. Um, so that uh, was a sneak preview of um, what is hopefully the next generation of the coffee brewing control chart um, based on the results we found so far and we're, results we're continuing to find. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank um, my advisors, uh, Bill Ristenpart and Jean-Xavier Guinard, um, Dr. Scott Frost and Andrew Cotter, whose results I presented a small amount of, the undergrads uh, from the Coffee Center, um, and then we had funding from uh, the Coffee Science Foundation, especially the Coffee Association, underwritten by Breville. We had our brewers donated by Wilbur Curtis Co. And I want to thank Jen Apodaca from Royal Coffee for donating and roasting the coffee. Great. Thank you, Mackenzie. Um, that was fantastic. So, um, wow, such a lot of information there, and there's a lot of questions. Yeah. Um, so we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll, uh, well, we have, but good thing we've got some time to, to get through some of these questions. I'll begin with the first one, which is you're addressing a, a group of uh, coffee people. And of course, coffee people will naturally be curious about the coffee that was used to do these experiments with. Can you talk a little bit about the coffee or coffees and the various roasts that, that were used in all of these different experiments? Yeah, so for the temperature project, it was all um, the same um, it was a medium roast uh, Honduran coffee. Um, yeah, I, I should have put the roasting curves in supplementary slides. Uh, but um, yeah, so it was a washed Honduran medium roast coffee. Um, and then Scott's data was collected. So that was from my study and for Andrew's study. Um, same bean brewed uh, 27 different ways. Um, and then Scott's study was also a Honduran coffee, but roast to three different level, a wash Honduran coffee roast to three different levels. So a light, a medium, and a dark roast. Great, and that was a specially grade uh, 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 Honduran coffee that came yes. from Royal. Yeah. Yes. Great. Um, so speaking of the temperature, um, there were some questions about where the temperature was measured. Was that, um, with the temperatures that you were referencing, was that, um, uh, uh, measured at the place that it's coming out of the machine, or at the slurry at the at the top of the of the uh, of the brew basket. No, uh, that's where it's coming out of the machine. Okay. Um, so a, a couple questions about the uh, the tasters themselves um, the, in your panel. I know that that's your specialty. Here's an interesting question, which is from Ryan: Is there a way to do this without human tasters? Is there a quantitative analysis that could be done? Um. Well, I mean, that's the big question right now is uh, human subject research is put on pause for a while. Yeah. <laughs> um, sort of. The, the thing, the reason we use descriptive sensory analysis is because flavor and taste are really complicated and, um, and there are so many interactions that you can measure all of these different flavor compounds on um, various chemical instruments. They're pretty time consuming and expensive. Um, I measured just sugars in coffee in one of my previous study and that was on a machine that uh, costs probably more than most people's houses. Uh, <laughs> and uh, took multiple weeks of work for uh, and nine samples. So um, it's time consuming and you're not gonna get an accurate picture. Um, for example, so I, I did a previous study and found lower TDS coffees perceived as more sweet, um, which is why I analyzed the sugars, but didn't actually see a higher concentration of sugars because there's a, an effect of aroma on the perception of sweetness. Um, so sweet associated aromas like fruity, caramelized, things like that um, will trick the brain into perceiving sweetness, even when you're not actually tasting it. And it's just really hard to quantify that chemically. 
um, because there's so many moving parts. Yeah, and one of, one of the things that I've learned about doing um, sensory descriptive analysis with a panel is that the idea is to sort of treat the panel as if they were an instrument. Yeah. Um, themselves. And, and, uh, and, and one of the things that I've learned in the past few years of learning about your work and other people's work is that, is that by doing that, you can really get so quantitative data from a group of, of humans, which is, we think of humans as being inherently subjective, but by, but by working with um, uh, reference standards as you do and, and applying uh, statistical analysis and treating them like an instrument, you can get um, really quantitative data. Yeah, and there's like, there's statistical standards that account for human tasters having variation. There's different models we can use to account for the randomness in human tasting. Um, Cause you know, people, people can be in inconsistent. Um, and we train them to be as consistent as possible and the models account for variation in human tongue. <laughs> yeah, yeah totally. um, Okay, so um, there's some technical questions about, about temperature, so let's get into those a little bit. Um, Oscar uh, um, is, uh, I'm sorry, rather Joao talks about, um, uh, how was was the uh, how was controlled the different energy among the coffee molecules as three different temperatures generates three different energies and as a consequence different time for the percolation on the samples brewings or was it not considered since it was too small a dis uh, a difference? Um, sorry, I'm yeah, I think. My 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 take on that is is uh, energy and uh, uh, temperature is a is a measure of the energy in the coffee yeah. in, in the water um, at that moment. So by controlling the temperature, you are controlling the energy in in, yeah. the, uh, in the extraction water. Yeah, and if that if I mean that makes a difference on extraction, but the different variables would change to control extraction. Yeah. Um, um, let's, uh, a few people are, um, are asking about where the, uh, the research is, uh, is published and available to them. I'll speak to that a little bit. Um, uh, and maybe you can talk about the academic publication part. I'll, I'll talk about the plain language part. Um, the Especially Coffee Association is busy publishing, um, plain language versions of this research, which means, um, uh, 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 reports that are designed for a coffee audience like us. And those have been being published in 25 magazine. I've just in the chat put a uh, link to a little microsite where we're putting all of these outputs. Um, Kenzie and her colleagues have, have been um, preparing uh, articles for us that to help us explain these things and also include some of the charts and details of the research. But in addition, all of this is produced academic research. So do you want to speak a little bit to that, uh, Kenzie? Yeah, so um, just this week, actually, we were able to submit this project to Scientific Reports, um, which is a nature journal that's open access. Um, so the academic publication uh, is currently in review. So that will take, unfortunately, probably a few months, because if not longer, I don't know how the current situation is affecting review speed, um, but uh, it'll go through peer review and eventually be published, hopefully, in that journal. Um, and uh, so that will be linked on the page Peter shared as soon as it is published online. Um, I think this talk will be published too, so um, feel free to share it with your colleagues. And yeah, hopefully um, we'll be getting the plain text version of mine and Scott's research with the RSM and the coffee brewing control chart update out fairly soon. Yeah, and and the nice thing about those academic 
publications is they generally have all of the methodological details. So um, there's some questions in here about real specific things about times and temperatures and stuff. And yeah, and, uh, and yeah. I think I could share that if anyone wants to get in touch. Um, I yeah. Can, so I um, email yeah. in the chat. Great. Um, let me, uh, this, here's a question while you're doing that, here's a question that, uh, that kind of goes off something that, that you were saying right at the end there, which is, do you think that it would be more accurate to have different brewing charts for different coffees? Meaning that a washed Ethiopian would have a more, would have more florals than a washed Honduran, um, probably at any TDS. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's, in theory, you could create these kinds of response surface um, maps for different coffees, right? Um, but I, I, I think what we're looking for here is more overall trends rather than trying to paint a picture of any specific coffee. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that um, it would be maybe a really interesting undertaking for some sort of some coffee company you could use this methodology to create brew guides for your own roasts um, if you have access to a sensory panel. Um, but yeah, I think the, the goal is to look at more ubiquitous attributes like sourness and bitterness. And, you know, even though, or, you know, the floral flavors, even though different types of coffee are going to have different intensities of light roasts are gonna be more sour than a dark roast, dark roasts are gonna be more bitter. Um, you'll still, what we're trying to show is that you'll still, regardless of roast, see that peak in sourness at the high TDS, low percent extraction and whatnot. Mm -hmm. There's another question about, um, uh, about seeing if there was a significant impact on perception due to the duration of the view. Uh, I'm sorry, of the brew, uh, the duration of the brew. So they're talking about the time period of the brew. Could you talk a little bit about that um, as a variable? Um, yeah, so mm, the, time, the brew time um, often correlates with uh, percent extraction. Um, I know that I don't think this was published, uh, but I I believe Scott did a triangle test, so discrimination test where um, when recruiting for panelists, um, where panelists got two of um, one duty cycle and therefore brew time and one of a different brew time uh, at the same TDS and percent extraction. Um, and people weren't able to tell the difference. Um, yeah, so there's actually, there's, um, uh, one of the other students, and Bill may have presented on some of this, I didn't get a chance to see his talk, is uh, um, working on more engineering models of um, how time, brew time impacts the sensory, prof or not sensory profile, extraction. Um, more specifically, because another criticism of the coffee brewing control chart, this is maybe a little bit of a tangent, but um, is uh, TDS and percent extraction are output variables. They're, they're, we, we were able to control them, but a control chart should be related to what you're inputting and, um, and show you what your output is going to be, what your TDSP you're going to be. So um, there's more engineering work being done on that side. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's right. And that's, that's one of the, um, glorious challenges of coffee brewing, right? Is that as you're, as you're any variable that you, that you change is going to have an impact on, on the, uh, the rest of the variables. Yeah. And, and, uh, and so, um, in order to manage, you have to manage one variable in order to control the other variable, et cetera. So, so um, yeah, that's that's a a big challenge. Um, let me just ask you, perhaps as a final question here, 
Um, what what do you think the biggest? So, you know, you came in here probably into the into the work with some uh, guesses or assumptions or hypotheses. What was your biggest surprise for you as you uh, as you did this work? Um, in this particular project, um, I really did expect temperature to have um, more of an impact um, on the flavor profile of coffee. Uh, I yeah, I was honestly pretty surprised that that, um, that didn't have as much of an impact. Uh, I expected solubilities of different flavor compounds to change and there would be a change in relative ratio of flavors um, perceptibly at different brewing temperatures. Um, so. Yeah, I can say uh, for me too, that was, uh, that was another um, big surprise for me uh, of, uh, 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 that. So, um, yeah, uh, to learn about that. Well, listen, um, Kenzie, thanks so much for your time today. Thanks for a great lecture. Um, and thanks for all the research and work that you do. So we'll be, we'll be, uh, keeping our eyes peeled for your publications as they come out. And, um, we're looking forward to, uh, to more research coming from you and from the, from the UC Davis Coffee Center. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Um, yeah. All right. So, um, and thanks also to, I, I have to thank again, all the sponsors that you see on the uh, on the screen here. Um, they all supported this work, um, particularly Breville, who who uh, who did the foundational underwriting for this, um, this work, which was uh, really important. It uh, wouldn't have been possible without their contribution. Um, and then these uh, lectures on Expo Weekend here are being supported by um, Pacific uh, Barista Series. Um, so please um, support them. They've made a great commitment to the uh, coffee community by supporting these le these uh, these lectures. And also Saver Brands, Chemex, and Roastar have also um, contributed here. Um, so thank you to them. Um, uh, there's always lots of questions about the, the lectures and we're gonna share those um, in due time. But meanwhile, please feel free to um, reach out, Kenzie has posted her email. Also, um, please uh, feel free to reach out to um, me at the Specialty Coffee Association. I can be reached at research at uh, sca.coffee or on social media if you've got any any questions about the research that we do or the outputs as, the, as they come. Um, we'd love to hear your feedback on uh, this uh lecture and any of the other lectures that you uh, participated in. So you can see in the chat and when you leave this uh, webinar, there'll be a, uh, a uh, link for a feedback survey. And please do give us that feedback. It helps us to make everything better. So um, with that, I will again express my gratitude to everyone here and to Kenzie. And um, thank you for a great lecture. And uh, we'll see you next time. Bye, everyone. <laughs>